This message is brought to you by House on the Rock Fellowship. We are a church that serves and cares for the Miami Valley region in Ohio. Before you continue, make sure to access the notes from our download section of our message page and have your Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. It's not a prop. It's not a skit. It's not a joke. It's just a cup of tea. That's all that it is. I love books, love books. They were uh, such a sweet repose for me growing up. My mother and father quick to give books and provide books and nurture reading. But you know as well as I do, not all books are created equal. Some stories are life-changing. Some books are trash, just trash. And some books are just kind of fun to read. You're not looking for it to change your life. You're like, you know what? I just want to read something fun. In my house, there's a bookshelf inherited from Elise's grandmother, and I try to fill it with good books. Books that at any time, a son, a child could walk over, grab a book, and I know and they know, you know what? This is a good story. I don't know what's waiting for me, but this is a good story. This is a well-curated tale. Dad says this is a good story to have around. Well, at the same time, there's a couple on there that are just kind of filling space. They're not stories that I would necessarily recommend. They're ones that I came across. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to read that. Um, It was okay. It was all right. The language was a little iffy, the plot was a little forced, the characters were a little, eh, not really something I'd want to spend any more than a half a day on. Um, But, you know, so that is what it is, and I know everyone's going to rush up afterwards, like, what was that book? Oh, but this book. Norman McClain's A River Runs Through It. You read that story? A river runs through it. You could easily read it in an afternoon. It's not a long tale at all. But oh, how I weep. I remember sitting in my backyard in the chair that my wife had gotten me. And the story had, and I was familiar with the story for some time, but had come back to it just recently uh, because of a, a podcast that I record with some other pastors, and we were doing this book. And um, it was a beautiful, sunny afternoon, and I'm going through it. And I know the plot. I know what's coming. I, I know that I will bawl my eyes out when I get to this page and I get to this page and I get to this turn of phrase and I get to this moment. And sure enough, it's the kind of story that you keep coming back to, the kind of story that shapes you and molds you. Yeah. We have been in the midst of the greatest story, haven't we? 39 messages in John's gospel. We started last October. Leading up to that moment, I had started being very frustrated with myself and our pulpit ministry and what was being taught and how we were teaching. This was all last summer. This was unbeknownst to you and desperately seeking a way to re-anchor our people and make sure that our people understand the centrality of Jesus Christ in all things that believe in him and walk in him. And the Holy Spirit says, you know, maybe you just need to spend some time with John. I'm like, I don't like John. I don't. I like Luke. Luke's my jam. I like Luke. It's 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 factual. It's clear. It's story. It's a narrative. It's it's good read. It's just move that sucker right along. I never, never, if someone comes new to Christ and says, What should I read? I never recommend John. I don't recommend John. Well, how can you not recommend John? It's John. John 3.16. Like, I know what it is. It's just, it's different. I like Luke. 
like Matthew. I mean, it's kind of Jewish and it's designed for Jewish people. Mark, that's, that's awesome, man. If you need to get into Jesus, get it hardcore, Mark's your guy. Hitting it hard, we're out. Good stuff. John, no, no. Spirit's like, yeah, Paul, I think it probably needs to be John. I know you're right, but I'm not allowed to say that. And so I, I got a, a copy of John, and last summer I just started going through and just started to weep. You know, as these poetical phrases and ideas just began to turn inside of me. And, and then the Holy Spirit, what you reading, Paul? <laughs> like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And what if, what if, what if we as a church family just spend some time in John? So I encourage you, get a copy of John. Maybe it's one of these journals. Have your scripture. Let's just hang out in John. We're not going to work our way chronologically through it. We certainly haven't. Wasn't written that way or intended that way. What if we just meditated on John, spent some time there? So for an entire year, we've been here, in and out, all over the place. And it's been wonderful. And I pray it's been a blessing. Um, but while at the same time, the Spirit came along and said, the people need to hear about John. Paul, you need to hear the message of John. Now the Spirit has said, Paul, it's now time that we need to focus on some other things too. And, and we're going to do that. We're going to start that next week. Uh, before you know it, it's going to be the Advent season. Before you know it, it's going to be 2025. And there's some things that the Spirit of God really wants you to grab a hold of. One of them being the Sermon on the Mount. One of them being the Sermon on the Mount. Um, our ladies are starting a Bible study through the Beatitudes. I think it's tomorrow evening. Is that right, Marion? Um, just a little bit of a primer, diving into those things. Um, but how do you set this aside in such a way that it's not just a book that you looked at at one time, but kind of something more than this, but certainly something that you're like, you know what, let's, let's remember, let's come back to. Within the greatest book, perhaps in the entire canon, is the greatest chapter that's chapter 17, and in chapter 17, the great prayer of Jesus before his arrest and his crucifixion, he says some summary words in 26, and um, I believe that's, that's a great place for us to uh, say thank you to John's gospel and thank you to the Spirit and remember some things that are most important. But to get to 26, what I would like to do is read all of 17 for you. Uh, this is Jesus' what we call high priestly prayer. This is the heartbeat of our Lord and Savior. This is where his earthly life comes to an end. He transitions into what he calls his hour, his great hour, his greatest work. These are his last words, unarrested, undeterred, praying to the Father, before he is taken away. And I, I wanna, let me read them to you. Follow along in your copy. Or just listen to the heartbeat of my Jesus. Starting into verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you. The only true God, the Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I manifested your name to the people You've given me out of the world. Yours they are, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. I've given them the words that you gave me, and they've received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. They've believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they're yours. All mine are yours. Yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you've given me, 
that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you've given me. I've guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world just as I am not of the world. I don't ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even the world does not know you. I know you, and these know that you sent me. In verse 26, this is where we're going to be. I have made known to them your name. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have given, you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Yeah. I'm going to read verse 26 one more time. That's where we're going to open up this morning. I have made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I have made your name known. That means um, revealed. There was something that was hidden that is now shown. People are able to know something they didn't know before. It's been revealed. In, in verse 6 of this chapter, uh, he says it in, in a similar way. He, he says it this way. He says, I have manifested your name. I made it manifest. It was invisible. Now your name is, is visible. Something that people couldn't grasp or get their hands on, now they're able to. Father, your name. The name of God is far more than just, like in my case, Paul Joseph Hicker. No, that's my name. That's not what he's talking about, is it? Jesus didn't just run around up and down the Mediterranean countryside with a big, you know, bumper sticker on his chest with Yahweh on it. I showed everyone your name. Everyone knows your name. I made posters and I made t-shirts and I sent out email blitzes and I put it on my Facebook feed. I made sure everyone knows what your name is. That's not what he means at all, is it? No. And the name is a big deal. It's very important. It's uh, part of the Ten Commandments when we're teaching foundations to people that important catechismal program, that foundation in the faith. We walk them through the Ten Commandments. That's right there in the Ten. Don't you dare carry the name of God in a way that is vain or empty. Sometimes we think like, oh, that's like about swearing. Don't say GD. That's bad. Well, while that is bad, that's not even close to what that commandment is really hinting to. 
You have been mantled with the name of God. You've been mantled with his character and conduct. You are his image bearer. That means you are to operate in a world within this system that truly reflects all that he is. That's what it means to be a name bearer. People know, Jesus is saying, people know, Father, who you are, what you're about, what your priorities are, what your character truly is. To live up to the name, not to besmirch the name, insult the name. The the Lord's Prayer, how does it start? Our Father in heaven hallowed be, what? Your name. Hallowed. Make it glorified. Lift it up. Make it reverent. I'm going to live in such a way, Father, that your name, who you are and what you are, is hallowed and glorified throughout my day. That's how the prayer starts. All the other stuff that we like to get hung up on about daily breads and watching out for donuts and not falling into the temptations, it starts with, Father, may I live in such a way that your name is glorified. May I live in such a way that people really, truly understand who you are and what you're about. And Jesus says, I have made your name known. I have made your name known. I've revealed it. I've manifested it. That name that is eternal life, he says in verse 3 of chapter 17, this is eternal life, that they know you. That's eternal life. I thought eternal life was what that I came down to the altar and I said a prayer. I thought eternal life was that I carried the right Bible translation. I thought eternal life was the fact that I had the right bumper sticker on my car. I thought eternal life was that I knew the right number of Bible verses. I thought eternal life was that I put enough money in the plate. I thought eternal life was that I served in the nursery. That's important. No, no, no. Jesus says, you know what you know what eternal life is all about? That they know you, Father. They know you. The quality of life. The Jesus life, the kingdom life, shining bright in a world of darkness. Father, I made that known to them. I showed them. I manifested it. I lived it. All of me pointed them to everything that is you. In chapter 14 of John's gospel, um, Jesus has an important conversation with his disciples. This is Last Supper. This is all about a few hours before he says these words that we're looking at right now. Um, John chapter 14, starting in verse 7. He says this, if you had known me, you've known my father also. From now on, you do know him. You've seen him. You ever see someone's kids and there's such a spitting image? Like, oh, I know who your mom is. Oh, I know who your dad is. You got your mom's nose. You got your dad's chin. You got your mom's attitude. You got your dad's laugh. Jesus says so as much to his disciples. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Verse 8, Philip says to them, Lord, just show us the Father. That's all that we really need. We just need you to show us the Father. Jesus says, well, have I been with you so long that you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, that the words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else, on account, believe the works themselves. Jesus, if you look at my words and you look at my works, you've seen the Father. If you watch what I do and you listen to the message that I share, Philip, you you see the Father. You see the Father. If you see Jesus, you see the Father. I have made him known. 
Father, I have made known to them your name. And what I say and what I do, the invisible has been made visible. But then Jesus goes on to say, I will continue to make it known. I have made it known. I will make it known. I am not just going to stop. I have made it known in, in my whole life, my earthly ministry before ever. I have showed people, Father, who you are. But now I'm going to continue to make it known. Well, what is, it, what is he referring to? I will continue to do it now. I have done it. I'm going to keep on doing it. How is he, well, what's he about to do? Chapter 18. Chapter 19 of John's gospel. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tortured. He's going to be falsely accused. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be stripped, scourged, crucified, nails bound to wooden planks, hauled up on a hillside outside of Jerusalem. Father, I will continue to make you known. Tremendous trial, tremendous torture. Through all of this pain, Father, I will make you known to them. They will know you better because of how I went through my hardship and my passion. What's important is there is another person who John contrasts with Jesus throughout these chapters. Not a lot of the disciples get name play, get real estate in John's gospel. One does in particular, his name's Peter. Love Peter. I identify with Peter. Peter's a screw up. Peter says the wrong thing, does the wrong thing. And John kind of puts humanity in Peter's response to things to help us understand that there's a way that Jesus is going to do life versus there's a way that we do life, and we need to see the contrast. Case in point, okay? Jesus is communicating to the disciples, hey, you need to understand this is where this journey is going. We're going to go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be arrested. He's going to be falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, falsely crucified. He will die. Peter takes Jesus aside and says, listen, we are all about this new kingdom thing. This is awesome. This is cool. Rome, got to go. All those old hats in Jerusalem, got to go. You're setting a new thing, and this is cool. That whole talk of dying, though, it really needs to stop. It's freaking people out. And Jesus' response to Peter was what? Get behind me, Satan! You have your mind set on earthly things, not on heavenly things. Oh, Peter, you seem convinced that what I'm going to do is set up a kingdom in earthly way, that this is going to be a power play. Peter, you have no idea how we're about to go about doing this. Peter, you're very, very very confused. Peter seems to struggle to take this at heart, that how Jesus makes the Father known is so radically different than how we would think to do it. Case in point, he brings a sword to a prayer meeting. Jesus is in the garden and he's at prayer. He's crying out, dripping drops of blood, such anguish, such preparation for what's about to happen. The soldiers show up. Jesus, tremendous mourning. And as the temple guard shows up and a Roman cohort shows up and Judas shows up, Peter grabs that sword, convinced this is how we take the kingdom. This is what we need to do. And he just starts a swinging. He just pulls out, he unsheaves that smoke wagon and he just starts laying it out. And Jesus, in not so many words, says, would you holster that, please? That's not how we do things. That's not how I do things. That's not the kingdom. That's not manifesting the Father. Peter's given another opportunity 
to manifest kingdom love and manifest the Father's name at Jesus' arrest, despite the fact that Jesus warned him that Peter's been prepped for this. Peter's been prepped. Peter's going to be given the opportunity to testify who Jesus is. Hey, weren't you with him? I swear, your accent is the same as that guy. I've seen you at his prayer meetings. I've seen you at his teachings. Aren't you one of his? Not once, not twice, but three times, Peter denies Jesus. Peter refuses to show up. Ultimately, because he won't show up, he decides to get out and go fishing. And he washes his hands. He's done. We have to be mindful, very mindful, that how we would just naturally conclude the kingdom is going to be manifest in our lives is truly anything like the way Jesus says, this is really how you manifest me. Jesus gets to the heart of that in, in John chapter 10. If I could read it for you. In John chapter 10, beware of Peter Hart. If your name is Peter this morning, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not at all. I kind of am though, aren't I? In John chapter 10, Jesus says it this way. John chapter 10 verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. He's talking about you. Did you know that? So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me. Okay, listen. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life and I take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. I make the Father known. I in tremendous devotion and self-sacrifice, in the presence of real sin and treason and pride in the power empire of Rome, I stand there willingly and I let them destroy me. I lay down my life. And the Father says, yes, yes. Well done, good and faithful servant. The result, love is shown. As his name is known, God's love is shown. As his name is known, as Jesus commits to manifest the Father's character, the Father's will of self-sacrifice and devotion and generosity. Mind you, this is one of the reasons we're going to spend so much time studying patience over the next few weeks. Patience. As Jesus commits to making the Father known, what he also does is lets God's love be shown. that they would see that I and you and them love together. The verse concludes. Amazing. Let me, though, before, just highlight a couple verses for you. Can you just, I need you to grab a couple ideas so that we know where to go from here as Jesus ends this prayer. One verse I want to show you is in chapter 17, verse 11. Chapter 17, verse 11 says this. Chapter 17, verse 11. I am no longer in the world. Okay, Jesus, my earthly ministry is over. I'm going to die. I'm out. My physical presence, not going to be here. Okay, 
I'm no longer in the world. But they are in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, look at this. Keep them, where? In your name. Father, it is my will. Who's speaking now? As the Son of God, as part of the Trinity, God himself. It is my will that they stay in your name, Father. That they stay in that place of manifesting your character, your conduct, your will. Would you keep them in that space? I've labored and I've worked that they would be in that space of your name. Father, that's what I want. That's what I want. Okay. If you look at verse 18 of chapter 17. To do that, Father, as you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. The, the mantle that you placed on my shoulders, I've placed on their shoulders. To be ones that make the name known. Make you known, Father. Keep them in that space. And as you sent me, I sent them. One more, okay? I want you to jump over to chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 30. This is at the very end of his passion. This is the very end of his torture, his suffering. He's hung hour upon hour upon hour in the hot Mediterranean sun, naked, paled on the cross. Okay? He's come to the end. Before he dies. I need you to notice what he does. Okay? When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it's finished. Jesus says, I did my work. Look what happens next. He bows his head and, read it with me, gave up his spirit. Okay, so a, um, a cursory reading is as it. He's like, means he died. Right? That's what he gave up his spirit, right? That's the natural conclusion would be he gave up his spirit. That's how to interpret that. That's not what that means. That's not what that means at all. To say he gave up his spirit means that now he has passed on to his apprentice his spirit. He's now mantled others with what he had. Okay? Think of Elijah passing down to Elisha. That's the, the, the connotation, the, the nuance of that phrase. When he says he gave up his spirit, he's now giving to his followers what was his, he now gives it to. To them. That's what that phrase means. Okay? When he says, he gave up his spirit. Okay, Father, it's my will that they be kept in your name. Father, as you sent me, I sent them. What's Jesus' last work? What's the last thing he does? I'm now going to give them the spirit upon them to do the very thing you sent me to do. It is the intention of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That in the way that Jesus made the Father known and made him known, you go forth to make him known. The Father's will, the Son's prayer, the Spirit's empowerment. that you continue to make him known. That's, that's, that's us. That's, that's what we do. It's kind of in our name. Little Christians. Little followers of Jesus. Little embodiments of God that we reveal to the world who Jesus is, what the Father was all about. How do we do that? A couple things to think about. As we, here's one. Continue to do Jesus' work. Jesus kind of spits in the face of those of us who would rest in the glory of the good old days. <laughs> we have remembrances of going to high school football games and the good old boys standing right in front of the press box, reliving the glory days of football games gone by. Okay? Okay? 
Hey, remember when, you know, back in 1978, you did that thing and then I did that thing and everyone cheered and we won the game. Woot, woot. Yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. This, Jesus says, I will continue to make it known. We need to do that. We need to wake up in the morning and say, Father, I will continue to make your name known. That the faith of a follower of Jesus Christ is not a static thing. I don't rest in what I did. The question is today, Father, what now will I do to make your name known? I will continue. In, I'm not going to have a static faith. I'm going to have a dynamic faith. I will continue to grow. It saddens me when individuals come up to me and can only relive the Christian stories of their Christian good old days. Oh, when God did this or I did that. Now, Jesus did say, I've done those, but now I will continue to. That we continue to do Jesus' work. Well, I, I put my time in. It's time for a younger generation. I'm sorry. You have not read your Bible very well. Continue Jesus' work. That's a commitment we need to make each morning. Here's something else as I reflected on Jesus' verse here. Continue to walk Jesus' way of walking. There's an ethic, a holiness about Jesus, isn't there? An ethic, a separateness, a difference. Peter wanted to take down Rome in the same way that Rome took down Jerusalem. Guns ablazing, power plays be gone. Shield in hand, sword in fist, let's go swinging. Peter would have made a great American. God bless America. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You need to do this the way the Father and I do this. That's how love is shown. We have to be committed to a very robust devotion to holiness and sexual ethics in how we spend and what we do, that we live the Jesus way. That the method lines up with the message. I manifested your name, he says. I showed it. I didn't just speak it. I lived that way. The world will hate us. But it's because we acted like Jesus. Yeah. A, a third thing that, that stood out to me, and, and maybe, maybe you've thought of it, continue to carry that uphill cross. It wasn't just that Jesus carried the cross. He also carried it uphill. Brothers and sisters, the Christian life is hard. If it's not hard, you're not doing it. Let me say that again. If your Christian life is not hard, it's because you're not doing it. The cross is an uphill climb. It's blood and it's sweat and it's tears and it's stumbling and it's, it's bruising. And it's defeated sometimes, and it's, 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 it's anguish some days. But if you're just resting on your laurels, there's a real good chance you're not following Jesus at all. And so uh, I would say something to snowplow parents, if I could. Do you know what snowplow parents are? Snowplow parenting? That's when you go ahead of your kids to clear out all the hardships and the trials and the difficulties so they have a nice smooth run ahead of them. You're killing your kids. Please stop it. They must encounter a hard world because it is a hard world. They need to carry their cross. They need to deal with their struggles. They need to handle their hardships. They need a faith that's their own. So please, mom, dad, oh, you had a hard day? Yeah, we can talk about it if you want. Sure, let's talk about it. Life's hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's difficult. Following Jesus is difficult. Well, if I have to make this decision. It's, it's the consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Let's hold on to the fact. Jesus held on to the fact that it's an uphill climb with the cross. But Jesus makes this amazing statement. And maybe this could help you and help your children and your grandchildren as you talk about following Jesus. This is in chapter 16, verse 33. Chapter 16, verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. Now that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. I, I tried to, I tried to, how can I put that in a way that I'll understand it and kind of get the cookies on the bottom shelf for me? Um, <laughs> and, and so forgive the illustration, but it made sense to me. It made sense to me. It's as if Jesus played the first half of the game. And he has racked up such an astronomical score. Astronomical score. We are so winning. And now as he has stepped off the field, and I have stepped into his place, all I really need to do is run out the clock. We've already won. Now, is the other team going to come at me hard? Yeah. Am I going to get kicked and bruised? Absolutely. Will I fumble and fail? For sure. But as I look up at that scoreboard, Jesus is like, we win. We win. We win. I have overcome the world. This week may be one of the hardest weeks of your life. But guess what? We win. We win. It may cost you your life. It may cost the life of someone you love. You may get that phone call that no one wants this week. No one wants this week. You may turn around and say, Where'd my teammate go? Or they may turn around and see that you're not on the field anymore either. But I look at the score and we win. There's one more that I want you to reflect on as I reflected on this passage and then we'll have the artists come up. I need to continue doing Jesus' work. I need to continue walking as Jesus walked his way. I need to continue carrying that uphill cross. I need to continue to hear Jesus' words. I need to continue to hear Jesus' words, okay? What does that mean? You remember when Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, my people hear my voice? I need to make sure that I'm always brought back to Jesus' way of doing things which means I always need to have Jesus' message in front of me, which means I always need to hear Jesus' message spoken to me. Okay. This speaks to a little bit of the place of spiritual direction in our lives, if I could. Under shepherds, pastors. As we come alongside of you or seek to come alongside of you to say, Come back to the message. Let's come back to Jesus. Let's recenter. Let's make sure that in the midst of the trial, we're doing it Jesus' way. Whether that's through pastoral counsel or visits or sitting under the message, reading the book, going to parenting classes, sitting in foundations classes, making sure that your kids are sitting underneath biblical teaching. Make sure that you are prioritizing 
hearing the word of Jesus proclaimed to you. There's a lot of messages out there. A lot of messages out there. We need to make sure that we are giving ample space to walking in Jesus' words. Okay. Amen. As our artists come back up, I, I, I have a couple questions that, that maybe will grab a hold of you like they grabbed a hold of me. One of the questions was this. Does my life make Jesus' life believable to others? Let me ask that again. Does how I live my life make Jesus' life and message believable to others? Do I live in such a way and walk in such a way and work in such a way that when people encounter the message of Jesus, they're like, I don't get it, but I can believe it. I've seen him. I've seen her. I might think it's nuts, but man, they are so bought in. They are so committed. They are so devoted in how they walk and how they talk. You know what? Tell me about that Jesus guy again. I can, I can believe it. It's how I live my life. Make Jesus' life believable to others. Could we learn to pray and live like Jesus did in John chapter 17, 26? Jesus' words, could they become our prayer words? And with this, we'll stand and we'll sing. Could we? Yes, please. Father, I have made your name known. Father, I will continue to make it known. In front of your children, will you do that? Father, I will make your name known. In front of my spouse, well, you've never met my spouse. Well, that's fine. I don't think it matters. Did you ever meet Pontius Pilate? Nero? To be perfectly honest, the bar is set pretty high. Could we continue to make him known? Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our HOPE team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. And that's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.